My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Lift your hands toward heaven. And worship the Lord. Say something to the Father. It's important that you enlarge your capacity. The prophet counseled the widow. He said, gather vessels. He said, gather not a few. It was possible for the widow to trivialize that utterance of wisdom that came to her from the voice of the prophet. But the Bible said when the vessels were filled, he said the oil in the crew stopped flowing. Because the extent to receive from God is a function of the allowance that you grant His Spirit. This is why every time we come before the Lord, we enlarge the boundaries of our hearts. So that we can drink of His Spirit, we can touch of His essence, we can walk in depths that we've never known before. Open up your spirit. It's possible you came without an expectation. Create one now. <laughs> Create one now. Say something to the Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you praise, Lord. Go ahead and speak in tongues for a minute. Rapati peru brundo sabra ni na kabazastas. Salibandra prahosa vlahadi na maranda rakas. Yele barabandra sababari. Aila manda la brase brede balandra tidas. Male brasa bandra parazosos. Ahalima Rabba Sapairi Anatali Paranda Zoras. Stay up your spirit. Go ahead and stay up your spirit. Yambe Rosa Pate Parina Sabaya. Le Parazendro Prazese Valatinas. They call the glory, Lord. They call the honor. The hour has come. That we may be enabled of God to gain ascendance into His realm. To look upon him, to behold him as he is, so that we will be changed, we will be transformed. He 
he may drink of his essence. Ah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, we come tonight hungry. Become expectant. We ask that you will fill us afresh. Cause us, Lord, to drink of the wine, the wine that sponsors alignment. Just tell him how much you love him. Just for a moment. Before you are overtaken by your emotions. Just tell him how much you love him. And mean it. Please mean it. Please mean it. It's possible that you have not said that this morning. You didn't say it this afternoon. And even this evening you may live here not saying it. We look up to you, Lord. We are persuaded in our spirits that you will do a new thing in our lives. In the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Sit down for a moment. Needed to step down the atmosphere a bit to be able to share with us a few thoughts before we begin to pray. We realize that we are in a strategic season in the progression of the operation of the Spirit of God. When you study the patterns of the operations of God with humankind from scriptures, you would realize that not every season are the same. There are certain moments in the spirit that are Kairos moments. And if you miss those moments, everything you would have done in a longer season might just be a waste. And when we look upon scriptures and we see that these things, these patterns repeat themselves from time to time, it becomes important for us to become sensitive. And so one of the things I realize in studying the scriptures is the fact that discernment is one of the greatest heritage of a generation. A generation that is without discernment 
is a generation that is about to waste divine investments. Because there are many things we can do in God, given the obvious fact that we have a lot of potentials. But what informs the strategic things that we should do in, a, in the kingdom is born out of our discernment of what God is doing in our generation and in our time. All the things we do in the kingdom are very important. But not everything we do is expedient. It is discernment that informs us what we ought to do by time. So the Bible spoke of the sons of Isaac in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 verse 32. It said they were men that understood the times and the seasons. Everybody in the clan was part and parcel of all God promised. They were all qualified for the heritage of God. But not all of them knew what they ought to do for the season. Only the sons of Isaac, by the powers of discernment, understood and knew exactly what Israel ought to do in the season. And it was on the strength of the ministry of the sons of Isaac that Israel was able to maximize the potentials of God that were weaved into different strategic seasons. Your zeal is not enough. Even your general knowledge about God is not enough. It's possible for a man to understand the ways of God, yet fail out of what God is doing in the season. But when we begin to understand the protocols that are required for us to maximize seasons, then sensitivity becomes one of our greatest compass of navigation. A lot are not aware what God is doing in this season. This is what informs careless living. This is what informs lack of right priorities. This is what informs lack of buttons. They believe any day, any time they show up, things can still work out. I'm sorry to inform you that spirits don't operate that way. It took God 700 years to prepare the Israelites for the coming of the Messiah. The prophet Isaiah prophesied it. He gave a narrative of everything that will happen in the season of his appearance. All the indicators were rendered by prophetic intelligence. But when that season came, the whole generation lacked discernment. There were many people that were committed to the studying of the Torah. In fact, they came up with a sect called the Sanhedrin, doctors of the law, that studied the ways of God and understood the writings of Moses. But when the Messiah came, he was walking the street, they could not recognize him. They called him a carpenter. They were praying, they were fasting, hoping for the coming of the Messiah. But discernment was lacking. In a whole generation, only three people were aware of what God was doing. The number can be that small. This is why when God wants to unveil a new season, He raises men to raise alarms. So that many lions and lionesses can be awoken to what God is doing in that season. And enter into the fullness of their ordination. So John in his generation cried from the wilderness. And when John roared in the wilderness, the people that had that kind of body to be relevant in that season, they heard him and they recognized his voice. And Jesus himself, when he showed up, he went to John to receive validation from the ministry of John because he was the only accurate man in the world. Before I begin tonight, I want us to pray for discernment. Because the journey is far. I want to share something this evening that if you are not discerning, it may not make sense to you. I'm telling you the truth. If you are not discerning, it will not make sense to you. You will not know why many people live the life of sacrifice and their lives, if it were in their day and time, made no sense. It is because of what they saw. It's because of what they knew. It's because of their understanding of the move of God and the role they had to play in the move of God in their generation. Where you are seated, just bow and tell God to open your eyes to see and to hear beyond what I will say.
Beyond everything, I will communicate that God will furnish you with discernment tonight. <laughs> because if you hear what I'm saying from the depth where it will be uttered, your way will change, your lifestyle will change. A whole lot of things will be altered and turned around in your life. Knowledge itself will not profit you enough unless you are discerning. Because you may know a lot of things, you will not know what is strategic for the season. Ask the Lord for a discerning heart tonight. I'm deliberately stepping down so that we can really pay attention to hear these things. Because these things are not about this meeting. They are things we will carry from this meeting and practice every day of our lives. If we must count, if we must be relevant in our generation and even in eternity, we cannot afford to live like the world. The civilization of this world cannot define our reality. We must be different. Not different because we want to create impression, but different because there is something breaking upon us from another dimension. And the powers of that which breaks upon us is beyond our will. We can't resist it. We can't fight it. It alters our very motivation and it informs our emotions. The way we think, the way we act, the way we respond to circumstances. Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. In the last five minutes, I will begin to fly. But these things must be communicated in its most simplistic fashion. So that the least among us can understand it and work with it. We have gloried so much in number, but there is no rank, there is no stature. I wonder why we come to territories where there are 90% Christians as citizens, yet there is darkness. We come to territories, everybody is talking about God, yet there is darkness. It means there is something wrong with our belief system. There is something wrong with our understanding of what God is doing in our generation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Father. He was seated on the throne. God is interested in every generation because the things that God does, they don't begin with a generation. It's a stream. It's a flow of an operation of God. Everything you stumble into today did not originate with you. You will be amazed that the dimension of God that is breaking in your life, breaking out in your life, was the same thing that Enoch pioneered. And if God opens your eyes, you will realize that there are over a thousand people that have worked on that lineage. You are, you are just given the opportunity of representing that dimension in your, own, in your own generation. And when your work with God is accomplished and you leave, somebody else will take over. The message you are preaching, if God opens your eyes, you will discover that that message has been in the earth as a witness for more than a thousand years. He may come to you and you will think it's new. It's not new. Nothing is new. The dealings you are going through, you will think there's something special about you. That's why God is passing you through that kind of dealing. If God opens your eyes, you will discover that over a thousand generations gone by have had the same dealings. When you begin to tell your story, you will now realize that what is happening to you is not new. There are many people that have had the same encounters and the same experiences. If you study deep enough, you will realize that every encounter you have had and everything that has happened to you have happened to somebody before. You are only a candidate and a witness in your own generation. The same way, the general operation of God is not peculiar to a generation. It, it's only coming to a generation because there is something God wants to do. And in all of these dispensational operations, there are strategic seasons. Where God releases a new investment of His Spirit in order for people to catch it and to run with it so that His kingdom can be advanced. This is what informs Kairos moments. So we can be living our lives the way we want, but a season may come and a new kind of government is established. And for your life in that season, you may realize that suddenly it becomes a taboo for you to eat in the morning. That is not a doctrine. 
You may wake up all of a sudden and one day it becomes a crime if you don't pray at night before you sleep. Sometimes it may become so real that a being can come tapping you at night and every 1 a.m. in the morning you find yourself waking up and you will check the time and you will discover consistently for four days you have woken up by 1 a.m. If you are not discerning, you will not know that you have been recruited into something that is higher than you. You may think it's a coincidence. Then maybe you go for a prayer meeting and then you are gisting with your friends and you say, I don't know what's happening. Every day I wake up by 1 a.m. Then somebody say, you don't mean it. The same thing is happening to me. That's when you understand that you are in a clan. You may find out that you just entered October and all of a sudden it becomes a crime. You want to eat in the morning and then it's as if you are sinning. Uh-uh, what's happening? You drop the food and then you feel light. You, wake, you go around 10 a.m. You want to eat again. It's like you are sinning. I say, what's going on? And then you ask two or three spiritual men and they say, oh boy, God told me to start fasting from 1st of October. So there's something he wants to do in November. You know what? You didn't go high enough to access enough information. Somebody that travels higher than you has more information. So that person will tell you, there's something God wants to release in November. So the people that are candidates, they can't eat in October. Meanwhile, for you, you just felt it was wrong to eat in October. Somebody else went deeper and he has more access. So God told him that there is something that will begin in November. Meanwhile, for your own information, in the past seven years, God has been recruiting people. Something will break out in 2020. This is why most of you who are sensitive in the spirit, some of you gave your life to Christ three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. But you will notice that the moment you gave your heart to Christ, it was a rigid government. You thought you would come to God and have fun, but the moment you gave your heart to Christ, it was lost upon lost. The reason is because you were born in a trying season. You were born in a transition season. There were people that gave their hearts to Christ ten years ago. They could afford to go and sin and come back and say, Lord, I'm sorry. And it's okay. But now you gave your heart to Christ and it was as if there is a gun on your head. You were born in a transition season. And the reason is because the Holy Spirit is urgent upon you because you have been numbered into what God wants to do in the next season. And your time is short. So you will notice that some people gave their heart to Christ in this season. And they started with 40 days dry fast. Have you seen people like that? Some people gave their hearts to Christ in the last seven years. And they began to prophesy from the day they gave their heart to Christ. Heaven is urgent upon them because of what is about to break out. The reason is because we are in a transition season. So when we talk about emergence, it's because God is raising an army. There's a recruitment going on currently on the landscape. For God to raise a people that can bear witness in what he wants to do in the seasons to come. And I told you that these matters are deeper than doctrine. All of us that give our heart to Christ will be taught doctrine. There are 12 pillars of redemption. And every one of you who is supposed to be strong in the faith will understand the 12 pillars of redemption. However, your consecration is what will determine where you will stand in the move of God. This is why every one of us is taught doctrine, but the dealings of God in our lives are different. And I told you, for you to maximize the season, the first thing that happens to you is that you need to come back into your heart and begin to draw light from within. Because your consecration is not written on tablets of stones. Your consecration are written on the tablets of your heart. And every time the Holy Ghost comes into your life, the first thing He begins to do for you is that He opens up that chamber so that life begins to instruct you. That is why He said, we have received an anointing from the Holy Spirit. He said, that anointing teaches us all things. And I told you the first way God begins to instruct us is through the intelligence of bodies. Ah, when we were younger on this thing, we were learning, we needed to learn a lot of tools because you enter some territory, the ground is dry. So you can wait for 30 minutes to find a sound that can pierce through the ground. Else there will be no power. We enter some territory, we have to pray in tongues for two hours. Else there will be no power. But when God began to introduce us into syllables of spiritual growth, a point came when we received power as a heritage. So now we is at we. <laughs> Don't worry, you will receive encounters this night. A lot of people will be healed this night, instantly. It's not uh, try to exercise your faith. No, that you came, your faith is enough. <laughs> because you came, your faith is enough. So relax. Don't bother about that. Let me explain what I'm explaining. I want to share it from the Z coordinate so that you will know the reason we share these things the way we share them and we even tell our stories is so that you will know 
that there is nothing special about anybody. Everybody God is using. God is using him because he understands something and he has committed his life to it. The day you commit your life to the workings of life that is sponsored by the Holy Spirit, that day your life will change. So men are special because of what they have committed themselves to and what they have become on account of their interaction with the Holy Spirit. Nobody is special in that he was born special. You can be born where ten angels are standing. It doesn't mean you will be mighty among men. The reason men are special is because they discovered their ordinations and they paid the price in order to satisfy the dictates of those ordinations until it began to find, it began to find expression. Hallelujah. And this is why we share what we share the way we share. So I said, God is currently trying to raise a generation, a generation of people that can bear the scepter of the kingdom and to wield the hand of God until his counsel finds expression in different territories. There is something God wants to do in this land. There is something God is doing in every other territory. And it's so unfortunate that spirits as powerful as they are cannot find expression in the natural realm unless by the agency of man. So every spirit, including the sovereign God, is limited by man because he designed the system that way. When he created man, he created man to be his agency that will give expression to the things that are locked up in the heavens. He never intended to come into this world and walk on the street. There are times where you may see light in your room. That is not God's standard. It's an encounter and it's for a reason. But when that encounter comes and goes, God will leave you with laws. Those laws are the things that will make you maximize that encounter. Because God will not come to you every day as a flame of fire. Everything God wants to do is locked up in one man or another. So the people you see walking on the streets, they are the answers to all the prayers we are praying. The people you see walking on the streets, they are the answers to all of the dimensions of God we want to find expression. But the question is, do we understand what it takes to travel into the womb of life until we can give expression to these things? You may be shocked that the person sitting to your left is the key to revival. We are praying to heaven, but God is awakening that man. The day that man wakes up, revival will be born. You can be in your family, you are crying to God for an intervention. What you may not be aware of is that the priest that will liberate that family may still be somebody on bomb shot who goes to club every Friday. So if your eyes open very well, you will know that the salvation of the family will not come from heaven. It is locked up in somebody, but the devil is wise. Because the way demons operate is that they check out your star in the spirit. And when they understand that you are captured in the strategic work of God for a season, they begin to fight you. When they saw the star of Jesus, Jesus was an infant. The day he was born, even before he was born, they discerned that something was about to happen. So everybody that came into this world, they checked him out. Are you the son of God? They went to Samson. Samson proved that he was not because he ended on the lap of a woman. Until Jesus came and the wise men saw his star from the east and they traced him meticulously until they found him in the manger. And they knew that this one is the king. Meanwhile, all the intercessors in the land did not know. All the prophets in the land did not know. All the rabbis in the land did not know. They were in the same Judea where he was born. But people came from the east. They read his star and they knew that the king has appeared. And they traced him until they found him. It will amaze you that it was people with dark powers that first recognized Jesus before the prophets. Because the devil is more on assignment. Let me tell you, you may say you are a prophet, you are sleeping every night. A witch of 10 years old can run a schedule of five hours of sleepless night for five years and it's not an it's not a testimony we are the only people that fast for six months and we tell everybody that we have been fasting for six months we don't know the things that matter a girl of 10 years old who is initiated in the witchcraft covo she can be awake every day from 12 to 5 a.m and she will run that schedule for six months and it's not a testimony so jesus was born no prophet could discern Wise men came from the east. They traveled for many days until they located Jesus. It was days later when they took him to the temple that some of the people who were accurate with heaven discerned who he was. Meanwhile, until he was killed and resurrected, the two days some people don't know. Because they don't understand the powers of seasons. When you understand the powers that are locked up in different seasons, what you will do is that you will begin to commit your life to the government of life. There is a government that is locked up in your spirit that wants to break out and find expression. That government is what will educate you about the ways of God. You may read the Bible, you will not understand the ways of God. 
You may be in a fellowship, you will not understand the ways of God until you commit to what God is speaking from your inside. Have you read many scriptures that you thought you understood until one day you sat down and the Holy Ghost brought illumination and then your eyes opened and you say, wow, is this what this scripture meant? You had recited it, you had quoted it, you have even used the scripture to move in power, but you don't know the depth of that scripture. Because the deeper life flows from your bowels is the extent of understanding that you can have. That is why we meditate for many months. We meditate for many years because we know that when a spirit speaks, his utterances are as deep as his reality. For example, Jesus came and said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. You thought Jesus was encouraging people to pray. What he was saying was not an encouragement. He is speaking deep into your DNA that the only way you can be a man is by prayer. So anybody who is not praying is not a man. If you are a man, what was wired into your operating system is the life of prayer. But there are many people who are not praying. So when you appear in heaven and you say, Father, they say, who are you? Are you a man? They are checking your DNA because if you are a man. <laughs> if you are a man, you say what? Men ought always to pray and not to fail. He came again and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. How many of the word of God have you eaten? When the spirit speaks, don't take him by face value. He will be wrong many times. So I told us yesterday, how does life begin to educate us? How does God begin to bring us into the womb of his reality so that we can perceive? You know, all of us can read about the love of God. All of us can read about the righteousness of God. We will study it, we will pray on it. After 10 years, we will be different people. Me and Rasim, me and Ogbe, we can begin to pray now for 6 months. After 6 months, Ogbe will become a prophet. And his eyes will open. His ears will open. Meanwhile, after 6 months, Rasim's heart will become deep. Every scripture he looks at, he will see all the coordinates of the scripture. And me, after 6 months, my tongue will become sharper. And then you are wondering what is happening. Even though we are praying and studying, there is another protocol working on our inside. That one is consistent with our eternal ordination. The one that fabricated us in his studio is who is the one that knows how that dimension works. So I told us yesterday that after we have done all we are doing, there is something that is breaking out of our inside. And we must pay attention to it. And I said the first thing that breaks out from our inside is what we call the utterance of buttons. Every believer has a button part time. There's a button that the Holy Ghost puts upon his heart. That button is what will lead him in the direction of his calling. You may live for 30 years. You may be in this kingdom for 30 years. You may even be an elder in church. They will ordain you as a deacon. You will pay all the money for the church building. But if you have not begun to respond to body, the angels that write the code of your destiny will have nothing to write. Bodies are the things that God furnishes in the heart of a man that begins to draw him away from the educational system that he has been introduced to by the world and he comes deeper into God. It's possible for you to be a doctor and then you are now seeing everything from the angle of a doctor. When they tell you about healing, you now say, well, it's important. Yes, healing is real, but you see, you have to always keep your hands clean and you know, um, malaria is, um, you know, malaria is because you are reading the scripture from the vista of a doctor. So when God wants to help you to see the accuracy of truth, He now begins to put body in your heart. That body will draw you into a place in God where no logical thinking can substantiate. So a man who was in the palace, who was living very well for 40 years, all of a sudden woke up one morning and then he said, no, why would the Israelites be in captivity? I'm wondering how come he didn't notice it until he was 40 years old. He thought it was logical to live in Egypt. Because the Israelites were actually silly, and that's what slaves do. But when he was 40 years, something happened. A new sequence of life began to flow from his soul. And then that thing made it uncomfortable for him to sit in the palace. So the Bible said in Exodus chapter 1 verse 11, that Moses will go and join the Israelites. And he was receiving their bodies. And the point came, he saw an Israelite fighting with an Egyptian. He lived as an Egyptian all his life. But he now saw the Israelite fighting with an Egyptian. And that body was so strong that he didn't go to separate them. He killed the Egyptian. What is the logical way of explaining it? You can't explain it. If you want to know and understand his life, go and check the intensity of what is breaking out of his spirit. You will not know why somebody wakes up in the morning and then he's praying from morning to night. You will come and advise him and say, no, 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 this thing you are doing. You No, 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 it's not like this. It's not like this. You can't understand him. The only way you can understand him is when God shows you the intensity of what is breaking out of his heart. Why would John the Baptist 
a son of a woman that prayed to God until she was old. It was in her old age that God remembered her and gave her a son. And then all of a sudden, something began to happen in John's heart. And John decided to pack his bag and left his father, who was a priest. The priests those days were living a luxurious life because they were like gods among men. John must have been introduced to the way of luxury. But something began to happen on his inside. He couldn't deny it. And the Bible said he was in the wilderness. Why will you pack your load? Can't you serve your God in your father's house? Is it written anywhere that before a man serve God, he must leave his father's house? It is a language in the spirit. You can't substantiate it. It is God himself that brings it because he has checked the scope of your ordination. The only way you can walk into the fullness of your ordination is when you turn that button. That button is what separates a prophet from an apostle. That's what separates a prophet from a politician. A politician's body may be to bring legislation that will make life easy for the people. And every time he talks, you think he's obsessed. What is happening is a body. He can't explain it. He will come and if people are in captivity, say, no, the government can't do this. This is supposed to be like this. It is a body. A business person only thinks in terms of money. He will look at you and say, no, 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 no. If we put this money like this, like this, we will achieve this result. That's the way God designed that humankind should be educated in the way of spirit. Because there is no way you can connect to a spirit except you begin to interact with the life that flows from that spirit. And that life is not cognitive, it is spiritual. This is why most of us are different and we cannot explain the contradiction. You can even come to a man, come to a fellowship, join a church and they want to clone you by all means. I was in a church where everybody permed their hair and they spoke Queen's English. And you don't have any other calling unless you are part of what is happening there. But this thing was breaking out of my spirit. I was trying to respect the people. I tried but the more I tried the more I died. I respected them until a point came the body exploded. And I ran away. So I told us yesterday, when a spirit wants to educate you, it begins with bodies. The body in itself is not enough. Because the body is actually a spirit's way of wooing you. He said when Moses was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had accepted that title for 40 years. How come all of a sudden, it was now a sin to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He said he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the riches, the pleasures of Egypt. He left Egypt and ran into the wilderness. How do you compare a palace with a wilderness? It was responding to bodies. Because the only way a spirit can teach you is when you are separated. And the only way a spirit can separate a man is through the investment of bodies. You can be at home and you will become so comfortable. The Holy Ghost will come and tap you like this. Wake up and pray. You wake up and do like this. Ah, you are sleeping on a water bed. An angel will appear in your room like this. And then you go home and tell people, Oh boy, angels don't they appear from my room. You want them to hail you as a spiritual man. Meanwhile, the syllabus that the Holy Ghost is bringing, you can't receive it. So the only way he knows to woo a man and to suck him out of his world is to create buttons in his heart. And when that button comes, it brings about separation. That's when true summons begin. The language that your spirit will recognize, you will be shocked that you may not hear it in church. The Holy Ghost himself will draw you into himself. And when you come deep in him, then he begins to invest in you the instructions of your destiny. So Moses was sucked out of Egypt and he ran to the wilderness. He was there for another 40 years. Still watching the body of God that was in his heart. And the point came in Exodus chapter 3 from verse 1. The Bible said he led his, his father in law's sheep until he went to the backside of the wilderness, even unto Horeb. And that was where an encounter began. So, a believer who doesn't have an encounter is a believer that doesn't treat burdens correctly. Because burdens are the things that lead us into encounters. It is in the place of encounter that your burdens will be substantiated. If you don't have encounters and you only have burdens, you may destroy your life. Notice that when Moses was in Egypt, he had body. He thought the best thing to do was to kill the Egyptian. How many million Egyptians are there? If you started killing them the day you were born, you may die, they will still be there. So you will not fulfill your destiny. This is why a lot of people, they fail to attend to bodies. And they are running up and down. Today they have left school. You say, why are you no longer schooling? They say, no, no, no. They want to serve God. Who told you you serve God by leaving your school? A lot of people, they quit their jobs. And then you say, what's happening? They say, oh boy, we need to serve God. 
what is the instruction of your destiny? He doesn't have it. So instead of taking decisions in foolishness, it is better to first of all begin to attend to body. Your bodies will lead you to the place of your encounter. Moses' encounter was in Horeb. Your own encounter can be in your bedroom. Your own encounter can be in your workplace. But the question is, how well have you tended your bodies? When you tend bodies, bodies, pet encounters. And it's an encounter that they dictates the wisdom, the counsel of your destiny will be given to you. If you are still in that place where you are saying, should I do this or do that? You are no longer, a, you are not yet a candidate for destiny. Better go back and look for what God is putting in your heart and pay attention. Some of you will pray for many years before your body is crystallized enough to create an encounter. Some of you will give for many years. Some of you will fast for many years. I tell you, these roles are not easy. They are hard. They are hard because your soul will rebel against it. You can attend to every other thing but the buttons in your heart. Because every time they come, they come with laws. Some of you will discover that God will tell you not to sleep again. And then every night you are struggling. You think it's for one week. You think it's for two weeks. And it continues like that for one year. If you want to be relevant, you will pay attention to it. And if you attend it correctly, what will result is that it will result in an encounter. And God showed up and told Moses to go back to Egypt. Egypt, where you are running from, that's where your life begins. Because what I wrote before the foundation of the world is captured such that your life begins from Egypt. Your life does not begin from Jethro's house. You can be in Jethro's house and marry a wife and raise children, but in the canons of heaven, your life does not begin in Jethro's house. So you need to go back to Egypt. But how will he go back to Egypt? He gave him signs. He gave him authority. He gave him power. What do I do when I get back to Egypt? Take the people out to the land that I will show you so that they can worship me. His life was expressed. The narrative of his life was given to him for the first time. At first, he was a confused man. He thought he would kill the Egyptian. He thought he would confront Pharaoh. He didn't know what to do. The reason why most people who are charismatic and called are most confused is because they don't travel enough to the value of encounter so that the dictates of their life are substantiated. So you see them doing a lot of things, running here and there, and they think they are pleasing God. You don't please God by doing what you are doing. You please God by understanding what He wants you to do and doing the same. If you have not begun to have encounters, then it means you have failed in the class of bodies. And when you pass the class of bodies, the instructions of your destiny are given to you. This is how a generation rises. This is how a generation emerges. All of us will study the Bible. All of us will be taught in different schools of thought. But if we don't pay attention to the dictates of the inner life, we will never become. A lot of people know they are prophets from when they were five years old. But now they are 40. There is nothing happening in their lives. They failed to attend to bodies, so they wasted their seasons. They failed to attend to bodies, so they never journeyed into encounter. And because they never journeyed into encounters, they never received the instruction from their destiny. This is why many men of God have resorted in cloning people. Because people are confused. You come to a church, whether you are an evangelist, whether you are a prophet, whether you are a post, an apostle, it doesn't matter. All of you become pastors and you wear bow ties. And all of you preach the same message. Nobody travel enough to unlock what is in his spirit. Because they don't attend to the things that flow from the inner life. You see a man who is supposed to be a politician. His tongue is sharper than a blade. And everything God is doing in his life is to teach him integrity so that he can represent a generation. That man who is a politician is wearing a bow tie and is calling himself an evangelist. Because he was zealous for God. He thought that was enough. He didn't attend to bodies. Bodies are the things that separate us into our ordinations. And if we travel enough, we will enter into the valleys of encounters. And the deep the dictates of our destinies are given to us. That's the first syllable of spiritual progress. If you ask yourself tonight, what are the burdens that have been in your heart in the last six months? You'll be shocked that many are not aware. What are the instructions God has given you about your destiny? Many are not aware. And then you ask a Holy Ghost still believer, what does God want you to do? And then that person will be saying, well, um, um, prophet this told me this prophet that what are you doing with the holy spirit it's a wasted investment it's a wasted investment 
This is why we glory so much in crowd. But there are no men that have direction. Even our doctrines have been created in such a way that men are enslaved. You see people who are doing very well in their life. They meet a preacher. And all of a sudden they go and make a contradiction out of their life. Because they want to come and follow that preacher. They never understood the language of God that was in their spirit. They never obeyed and followed the dictates of that body until they discovered who they are in God. If we discover who we are in God, the kingdom will move forward. Elohim Adonai. The way you are looking at me, I'm... Elohim Adonai. I'm trying to calm down, but something is surging out of my spirit. Elohim Adonai. Every man who was ever great in this kingdom, this is the path they followed. I can show you from the beginning of the Bible to the end how men attended to bodies until bodies resulted in encounters. Until encounters resulted in instructions for destiny. Everybody you see making exploit in this life, God told them. There is never a contradiction around it. Bishop Oedeko will tell you, and God told me, God said, God said. How many God said are in your life? How many God said are in your life? I told somebody, I said, if at the age of 15 you can't hear the voice of God, there's already a crisis. There's already a challenge. And if at the age of 30 you cannot hear God, it means your life is about to become an experiment. And there are many men today who want to use people's lives to experiment different things. So the guy wants to start a church in Makodi. So he wants to test run whether it will work. And then you come with your destiny and submit it in his hands. And then he sends you to Makodi to see whether the church will work in Makodi. And after you are there for 15 years, they now discover that this thing is not working like this. Let's change the strategy. They now push you back. So you use your youthful age as an experiment of another man's laboratory. And you don't know why your life is a contradiction. You think God is so impressed. And then they come and tell you for 30 years we have been laboring. Laboring under whose vineyard? People pride themselves in so many funny things. We have been laboring. We have been laboring. Much labor. There are different kinds of labor. He said the labor of the foolish weary at every one of them because they know not how to enter the city. You want to know how to enter the city. The Holy Ghost creates an insurance policy for everybody. That is why God gives every man different bodies. So God can never be held responsible for a wasted life. The thing is, you don't know your body and you don't attend to it. If you do, encounter will be cheap. Nobody who sees or receives encounter is special. I'm telling you, nobody. You may think because this guy was born where angels, it's a big lie. Everybody you see today walking and carrying encounters on their head, this is what they do. It may take different time for us to enter into these things, but if we stay there long enough, we will see it. Apostle Arum said he fasted and prayed for one year until today, even if he's pray, preaching, sometimes he looks up and he sees Jesus. It's not because he's a special man. It took him one year to break into it. He left service, came back to Kogi State, and God told him, go back to Kanu. You have not finished attending to that body. When he invested in life on it enough, something broke out. It was in Kanu, he was preaching on a crusade platform. God said, you should go to Abuja. He went to Abuja and a job was waiting for him. This thing is not designed to make life difficult for anybody. It's a well-tailored intelligence from God to create a fortune for you, a place for you among men and among angels. But you may waste those commodities. You may waste those resources. And your life will be a struggle. And you will think God is so impressed. Those days growing up, we thought prayer warriors were poor people. And we thought because they were prayer warriors, they were supposed to be like that so that they can do some things in the spirit. It's a big lie. You can be a prayer warrior on the waterbed. <laughs> Elohim Adonai You will not know why we are religious people Most of you here are very effective in church And this is not to discourage anybody from church But I tell you What God has put in your heart You will be shocked that you are forgotten 
we can't emphasize these things enough. John the Baptist, his own father was the pastor. His father, he left his father and went to the wilderness. He knew what was happening in his soul. He had an inclination that he, he is supposed to be a voice, not a priest. I understand the, the, the policy of priesthood. I know the protocol. I know the, the altar of sacrifice. I know the lava. I know the menorah. I know the altar of showbread. I know the altar of incense. I know how these things are done. I know the laws of Moses. But Kai, when he checked his heart, what was raging in his heart was to cry. Meanwhile, when he checked the ways of priesthood, there is no priest that ever cried. What is breaking out in his heart is to cry, but no priest ever would cry. So he knew that he was in the wrong location. He broke the ties of sentiment. He left his father. I'm sure Elizabeth must have cried for many months because women understand the gimmick of sentiment. My son, you can't give up. My son, you know, about matters of ordination, I can't be your son. He went into the wilderness. He was there until when the guy came. He came with exactness of speech. They said, who are you? He didn't say, I'm John. Who are you? He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. How are you sure? What you are saying now was spoken 700 years ago. Who told you you are the one? Okay, what if you say you are the one? You claim you are the one and the Messiah doesn't show up. Because the job of the voice crying in the wilderness is to what? To reveal the Messiah. As if that was not enough, the guy now went and started doing baptismal services. Ah! The Pharisees came again. Why are you doing what you are doing? The one that sent me, the same said unto me, the one upon whom the spirit and light and rest is the truth. Oh God, who told you the Messiah is around? Are you sure you are not taking a risk? He had attended to bodies. That guy is speaking from the womb of encounter. He has seen a spirit and he knows that even if the foundation of the earth were to crack, the voice of that spirit cannot be a lie. When Moses migrated, you would think he ran because he was afraid. Paul came back right and he said, he saw him that was invincible. So he can mortgage his life and destiny. Because the spirit that spoke can never lie. Jesus never showed up. Only, of, only God knows how long that guy was doing that baptismal service. Did you read about Abraham? For 25 years, Abraham would go to the church and say, I am the father of many nations. Oh God, you are barren. Your wife is barren. You are impotent. What are you saying? I don't understand that English. Is it Aramaic you are speaking or Hebrew? No, I think you have diverted to Swahili. You don't know our language anymore because what we are saying is not consistent with the things we are seeing around you. I am the father of... He knows he has heard the voice of his spirit. If he denies that spirit, he will deny his own life. The Bible said people came to him to try to weaken him. He said he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. He didn't know how to stagger. He was strong in faith, giving thanks. You have not had a child, you are giving time. What are you thanking God for? He has heard the spirit. At that point, he's speaking from an encounter. So a man can be in a house, he only has one cup of water. Him and his brothers, they are all sleeping on a couch. But he said, God told me, I will travel to the nations of the world. And you will come and you will evaluate him. There's nothing appealing. You don't know. He is talking from encounter. He has traded with bodies until he entered the mountain where he saw his spirit. You will look at him. Oh, that is shoe you are wearing. The shoe don't chop up. You know, go look for another one. There is no money in his pocket. But he tells you, I will sponsor the gospel. I will sponsor the gospel. I will. You say, how is that going to happen? He has heard the spirit. This is why anything it takes to invest in a body is worth it. Because if that body can only take you to the mountain of encounter, your story is about to change. The elders of no old, they knew these ways. They understand how spirits work. That men of necessity must come to a point where they trust them with their lives. What have you heard? What encounters have you had? The reason is because you are not born with encounter. Those days when we were praying, some people will come and say, well, this person has money in his destiny. I say I have billions in my destiny. I will res I refute that God, that gospel you are bringing. Because you will notice that the only people that give testimonies are the people that their parents are rich. So they will now come and say, well, uh, Sister A has money in her destiny. I say, no, you didn't check my destiny very well. Check. You will see pounds and dollars. Because the things that make men is not on earth, it's in heaven. But you can only journey there if you find the mountain of encounter. Many believers have never traveled to the mountain of encounter. That's why we are confused. So today you hear, you see a politician do exploit and he stares something in your heart. You say, Kai, I'm supposed to be a politician. This is what I should be doing. 
and then tomorrow you go for a meeting you see somebody talking and moving in the power of god ah! you now say oh boy i just saw myself in that man so you go and start 40 days fasting on the 25th day you say oh boy this thing heaven you go die you, you go die you, you go die the holy ghost knows that there are many possibilities in this realm that's why he teaches you himself and the way he teaches you is to put something on your inside that you cannot deny and every time you find that thing you hit a cruise boat my friend here now see i can talk like this and i can decide to change my gear and if i want another flare if i give this man the mic and he begins to pray now just give him five minutes you will be shocked the cloud that we download into this place five minutes he found it and as he continues there that is the horn that the lord will exhort he said thy horn will i exhort like the horn of the unicorn your body will lead you to encounter and it will become your your weapon of war the reason many people are stranded in life is because they didn't trade with spiritual resources enough we are in church we are believers but we don't trade with spiritual resources some of you the power of your destiny is locked up in your tongue but you cannot know it until you go to the mountain of encounter that is when the lord will say put your hand in your bow, remove it and then you will know that your hand is a weapon of signs and wonders the staff you were working with all your life to support you you will not know that what you are carrying in your hand is the rod of god when you reach the mountain of encounter everything you have become an outstretched arm of god so moses will stand before the red sea and he said don't cry to me go forward how do i go forward sir there's a sea in front of us he says stretch thy rod oh this rod i carried it for 40 years walking like an old man i didn't know that this rod is the finger of god but when you enter an encounter even your tongue can become the finger of god your eyes can become a weapon in the spirit but all of those dimensions are on the mountain of god will you journey there a lot of people never and that is why we are confused that's why we are stranded that's why it looks as if the devil is so powerful it's a lie the day you attend to these things you will enter somewhere that everything about your life will become a wonder isaiah knew it so well he said i and the children the lord has given to me we are for signs we are for wonder we are not normal we are not ordinary not because we are born like this but we know the things that make the difference in this kingdom that's why you don't need any man to make you if god wants to make you he sends men to you but it will be an error for you to pursue men to make you it's foolishness everything you ever need for life and godliness is already invested on your inside he begins to speak to you like a body he brings distress he brings discomfort god will trouble you over the night to attend to it because he knows that he gave you a last card and if you don't do it nothing will work for you but many believers never pay attention when you travel with body and you begin to apprehend the voice of god then you will know that the voice of god is what makes a man invincible the voice of God becomes your advantage. And that is why we prize encounters so high. Encounters. We are defined by our encounters. A man who has no encounter is a natural man. Even the devil can play gimmicks with his life. The devil can do practicals with his destiny. Not a man that has encounters. He knows how to invoke the powers of heaven. Because he has been there. tonight i will pray for encounters that's the first thing i will do but before i pray for encounters i need to teach you how to preserve what god will give you we are pressed for time you see the way i'm talking we can't stop there's no time there's no time this man told me we have to live here by 8 30. okay okay he said some things now with his hand I don't understand sign language. So when we say a man is spiritual, a man is not spiritual because he's walking like this. Or because he says, you know, and then he pauses for five minutes. The Lord is good. And then his voice is, is a bass, is a baritone voice. The Lord is good. 
You know when the Lord appeared to me. <laughs> Most times we become clowns in a bid to create impression. Not a man that has traveled to the mountain. See, he can come and he'll be playing with you how far, waiting they happen, waiting they happen. But when he lifts his hand, he touches something. <laughs> Quit be religious. See, as I came here now, I could discern a lot of people. They wanted me to come in like this. And then I should, Holy Adonai. <laughs> if that's what makes spiritual, then it's cheap. Hey, it's cheap. Brother, brother, see, I fasted some, that I fasted from January to December, nothing happened. At the end of the day, the only thing God was taking care of was to make my soul pliable in his hand. I fasted for another year, nothing happened. I went on a stretch fast for three years, nothing happened. I was doing my master's degree fasting, I was writing exam fasting. Some of the exam I went, I was dozing like this. And I told myself that, ah, if God sees this thing, he will be so impressed. It's a lie. <laughs> if spirituality is to come and do like this, ah, then it's cheap. The comedians and the actors would have been the most spiritual men. Men are spiritual because they understand how to interact with spirits. They know when those spirits are angry. They know when they are happy. And they know what to do to invoke the dimensions of those spirits. Because by intimacy, they have dwelt in their realm for very long. And it's not doctrine that takes us there. It's personal consecration. And it begins with bodies. This thing will make you lose your appetite for many months. If you catch it, if you catch the true thing, it will make you lose your appetite for many months. It will make you deny friends. It will make you separate yourself from people. It will lock you away in your own house. They will be looking for you. They will see you. Because you can't deny the power that comes with it. Until a point comes when your life is spent on it. You will be wasted on this thing before you apprehend what it carries. Because you will know that in this mortal vessel there is no value. So God will make you spend every resource that is of your carnal part. Your mortality, your flesh will be spent. He will bank on your ability until he will make sure you fail in every of your ability. Until you know, like Paul, you will say, We are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. That's why you see an orator coming to preach, he's lying down crying. Because he knows the tongue has no power in itself until the spirit has light upon it. I was talking now. Ah, we will talk, they'll say, Oh boy, this guy, yeah, you are trying. When you talk, the best people do is to clap. Eh! Meanwhile, you came, you concocted everything you wanted to see, and people hear you, they clap. When you finish, they say, ah, wow, wow, wow. I see your boy. When we follow God and we, 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 we allow Him to chisel Himself into us, there are things you can't go say. You don't know where bodies will take you, they will take you to tight corners. There are times when you have legitimate needs. God knows you have needs. You are praying. He has no answer. Meanwhile, the little you have, He says, give all out. And then it doesn't make sense. I am praying for you to answer the prayer of my need. You have no answer. And the little one that I gathered by walking, He says, you give all out. It doesn't make sense. And then you will continue. You will even ask some people. When they advise you to keep some, your spirit, you will lose your peace. You will only have your peace when you obey. And then you keep giving all out. There was a time for six years I was not allowed to keep any money that enters my hand. I was literally living at the mess. Thank God I had sisters. Hey, oh, sisters. Ah, if you have a sister here, you are blessed. <laughs> you will just throw to the house and eat and come back. If money comes to you by your own hand, you can't touch it. I didn't know that was the vent of power. Until God did it, a point comes when it becomes easy for you to let go of anything. That's when you can trust Him. So God can now flow through you in an endless fashion. And then somebody looks at you and thinks it's the way you are talking. I heard the way Apostle Arame was talking. I went and talked like that. I talked like that. I entered into trouble. 
I now understood that there are certain things these men are not saying that is part of their lives. And the only way I could check it was to begin to observe what God was doing on my inside. That was when I knew that this pathway, they are rigorous. They are difficult. Have you been to that point when God carries you through a process after six months? You now went somewhere and they showed you a seasonal movie. And then you enjoyed it. And when you watch two series of the movie, everything you built for six months crash. God now tells you to go back to the beginning. Because the circle is not complete. You were laboring. Your soul had ascended to a level. You were seeing certain things happen in your life. And then you now went and made a friend. Because the lady called you and said, hey, you don't throw away me. They said, no, I don't throw away you. You say, okay, why we know they see again? You now came, laughed with her, and you hugged her. And you went home and you started thinking about her. And the Holy Ghost shows up. <laughs> when the Holy Ghost, when you were saying, I not throw away you, the Holy Ghost was saying, no, no. But there was a force. <laughs> I not throw away you, the Holy Ghost was saying, no. You ignored him. When you were taking your bath to go and see her, the Holy Ghost said, no. You ignored the Holy Ghost. Until you went and now you now hugged her. And when you hugged her, you were there for some time. <laughs> <laughs> and as you came home every night when you want to pray you say father you sense the anointing now you came home you say father everywhere is dry you now say okay maybe I'm tired you now own music you think it's about music father everywhere is dry then you now start fasting for 7 days nothing happened you fast for 21 days until you fast for 3 months that's when you sense it again next time you become careful See, <laughs> when you have attended to bodies, you have entered encounters, and you can trap the spirit. There is a culture that preserves it. That's what we call the remnant culture. I will show you the remnant culture in five minutes, then we'll pray. It is not easy to be a spiritual man. Tell your neighbor. <laughs> but only spiritual men can move the hand of God. <laughs> oh, I see. You will suffer in this life, bro. If it's God, you want to serve. Forget all those things they are telling you. Forget those things they are telling you. <laughs> I followed Pastor Chris. I thought spirituality was excellent. As a university student, we are going for meetings. We wear double breasted suits. We can save money for six months to buy one double breasted suit. And then when you are coming, the whole money that they gather together, they will use it to rent a car to pick you for the meeting. So that you create a pressure. Then you come down, you are walking like this. <laughs> until, <laughs> until one day he was beaten and he removed his suit. And I saw that his belt almost rounded his waist twice. <laughs> That was when I realized and following his stories there were some years when he fasted more than 70% of the days in that year. And then he could enter his room and lock the door and come out after two weeks. So I began to know the things that matter. This man, even if he's a dot that comes from heaven, they will sit on it until it becomes an encounter. Did you not read about Elijah? He prayed until he saw a man's fist. He knew rain needed to come in this season. So he kept on it, on his knees, in prayer, until he attended to that body, a feast appeared. And when that feast appeared, he knew exactly what it meant. These men are men that, even if it's a whisper from heaven, they can go on 40 days prayer and fasting to know the meaning of that whisper. Meanwhile, you, you are here, you even see a flash of light, and all you think is about is to tell your friends that you two angels are appearing to you now. You don't understand the intelligence of bodies. You don't know the powers of encounters. That's why you can't go further. You go for meetings, you fall, you cry, you jump. At the end of the day, your life is rotating around one spot. These are the things that make men. And if you have come to that point where a body has materialized into an encounter, there's a culture to preserve it. God is not a respecter of person, but God honors sacrifice. God is not a respecter of person, but God has respect for covenants. When you see a man that has entered into something in God by sacrifice, it's different from you. You will be amazed, and your arrogance may not allow you, but you will be shocked. 
that God gives up other people to die in the place of others. There are certain men that heaven is jealous concerning their matter. And if they cough, heaven will move. You will pray your prayer with all the English language that you know and quote all the scriptures you can remember. Nothing happens. But a man just passes and says, it's well, it's well, it's well. And that thing you were laboring for for three days, finish. Apostle told us a story. They were trying to cast out the demon from a madman. And all the prayer warriors were gathered and they were praying and laboring in tongues, laboring in tongues. And then when the Kumuyo came to pass, he now said, no, he's free now. He's free. He's free now. And then the guy who was mad began to gather himself. Ah, say, why am I here? Why am I here? I, I began to wonder. What do you mean, Father? I thought to say you answer the prayers of the saints. How come people are praying for many hours? It's not one, it's not two, it's not three. Over ten people. And you cannot rest. At least all of their faith and encourage them. Another person just passed and say, it's well now, it's well now. And then you answer as if you were waiting. That didn't happen because it's God's favorite. That happened because he has a stake in heaven. I told them in the morning, I said, the Bible said, for instance, it said the prayers of the saints, they are sent to heaven as orders. They are stored up in golden buyers. There are some people that have a lot of data in heaven. When you see God appear to somebody in Afghanistan, it's because somebody has created that vent in Congo. So because of that person, God can raise an apostle in Afghanistan. Nobody is there to pray to him. Jesus himself will appear. Why? Because that prayer becomes a tool that God can spend from. He said, Epaphras is one of you, a born servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you will stand perfect. So the reason the church in Colossus was prospering was not necessarily because the pastors were so anointed. It was because Epaphras was supplying prayers. So God can make the people perfect. You think such men God will joke with? A whole territory. He's standing perfect because of one man's prayer. If that man leaves the world, the territory will collapse. So God will keep him. There's a culture that preserves encounters. There's a culture that preserves relevance in this kingdom. Else, people may hear of you today. Tomorrow they will forget you as if you never existed. It's called the remnant culture. The people God is jealous about. There is something he teaches them to do so that they remain relevant. In Genesis chapter 6 from verse 5, the Bible spoke of how God looked at the earth and everything was corrupt. He said the thoughts and the imagination in the heart of man was continually evil that God repented that he created man. And God said he will destroy every living creature on the earth. But he now said, and God found grace. In the, in Noah found grace with God. That means in Noah's generation, only him had more stature than the whole world. And then what is it that Noah was doing? When you study Genesis chapter 8 verse 20, then you know what Noah was doing. The Bible says when he came out of the ark, he raised an altar. He knew something that no other person knew and was doing in his generation. So the reason God found grace with Noah was because of the kind of thing that Noah was doing. There is something you do every time you want to become relevant with God. You may pursue a lot of things. You may attend to a lot of bodies. When encounters come and God begins to crystallize his dimension in your life, there is something you will do to preserve it. It's called the remnant culture. There is something we do to remain the salt of this world. There are lots of people that don't do it. So they grow so mightily, the devil wait for them in the day of their shining. That's the day he cuts them off. So that their fall can be loud. Because they don't understand the culture that preserves spiritual investment. The remnant culture. In Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 43, the Bible said they continued steadfastly. That means they gave themselves rapidly to these things. They continued what? Steadfastly. These were men that were with Jesus. The Bible said in Mark chapter 3 verse 14 that they called them to be with him that he might send them. They had been with him. They had completed their discipleship. Jesus himself came in John chapter 20 21. He said, as the Father have sent me, so send I you. So Jesus had given them the same order of privilege that he had as the Son of God. But there was something they knew. They knew that this thing will not continue because we saw Jesus. A lot of people think because they saw an angel, they will continue to shine. The same message you preached yesterday with fire, you will come to preach it today without a culture of a spiritual man. 
and that message will not have power. You quoted all the scriptures, you quoted, you said everything you said, you even shouted God today, but no power. Because there's a culture that supports spiritual possibilities. The remnant culture. Everybody you see who is a high flyer and consistent, there is something he's doing. He said they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. In breaking of bread, in fellowship, and in prayer. Some of them were carpenters. Some of them were fishermen. Some of them were businessmen. But it didn't matter their profession. He said they continued what? Steadfast. There was something every one of them was doing as a lifestyle. Regardless of their profession. Remember, Jesus did not send them to the church. He said, go ye into all the world. Because Jesus is interested in professionalism. Go into all the world. But whether you are a banker, whether you are a doctor, whether you are a fisherman, whether you are a shoe shiner, there is a culture that supports the life of God. He said they continued steadfastly. That means they were not weary about doing it. This thing was something they did with zeal and motivation. Steadfastly. In the apostles' doctrine. In breaking of bread. In fellowship and in prayer. The day you trivialize these things, you are about to expire. This man knew it didn't matter who they were, they knew that this was the secret of stability in the kingdom. To be given to these things in Acts chapter 4, verse 6, he said, It is not me that we give ourselves to tables. He says, Select from among yourself men of honorable report, of faith, filled with the Holy Spirit, to attend to tables. He said, But we will give ourselves to. He didn't say we will pray and study the word. He said, We will give ourselves to. We will be, we will be sought out to these things. We are in a generation where people pride themselves because they have titles. Everybody is an apostle. Everybody is a prophet. But this man knew that the day they failed to give themselves to this thing, their apostleship end. The proof and the seal of their apostleship will become a caricature. The devil will make a mockery of them. They say, we will give ourselves to these things. It doesn't matter that we have seen Jesus. It doesn't matter that we know the Bible. We are instructors of the way of God. But we will give ourselves to this thing. Prayer and to the ministry of the world. If you check yourself, you will be amazed that these things are simple as they are. They are things that are lacking. How many times do you have fellowship with the brethren? And you want to survive the tides of darkness. Nowadays, all we do is to form different clans with different kinds of gossip to pull down other people. You see five people pray, you say, Oh, what God will do with these brothers? Wait until one of them is anointed. That's when you will discover the importance of fellowship. You will know that anointing is useless unless men can fellowship. Five people praying for the move of God. Then God suddenly rests on one. And suddenly, all of them are doing the same thing. When that one does something, God moves. The other four now will withdraw. And they will break their fellowship. And they will begin to gossip it. And then if God helps their heart. And they still follow him. The one who is anointed now separates himself. He now feels he's bigger than them. <laughs> fellowship is the proof that we have the life of God. Our ability to fellowship together in oneness. Is the proof that we are mature. The reason many revivals are truncated. Is not because the power of God is lifted from the earth. Is because a lack of fellowship weakens the potency of our corporate ranking. Revival begins with prayer, with repentance, and with a heart cry. That heart cry will cause a release of heavenly investment on the earth. But something happens. When that investment comes, many men become anointed. The anointing attracts fame, it attracts influence, it attracts power, it attracts money. When influence and power comes, what we do is that we break our fellowship. So there are no men who can steward revival. So the crisis of revival is not the inability of the church to release, to cause a release from heaven. It's the inability of the church to steward it. 
So revival ends up in big institutions, big names and big churches. But the territory remains in darkness. The reason the territory is in darkness is because we can't fellowship. The apostles knew it doesn't matter who is bitter. It doesn't matter who is poor. We will keep the fellowship together. And the Bible said, these be the men that turned their worlds upside down. The reason they were able to affect their territory is not because they were more powerful than us. They had fellowship. They had communion. They had koinonia. One man could shine for one year. It doesn't matter. Everybody will support that one man. We can come for a meeting. You are the one who is prophesying. I had a friend. See, when God wants to teach you certain things, He teaches you by experience. I had a friend. Those days when we started pursuing God, the guy was developing the prophetic. Encouraged me to do the same, but I was a student of the world. You know, we came from the faith college, so we speak, it happens. So there's no point trying to. He will meditate for long. Sometimes he will say, Write something, you will write. He will now try to pick what you have written. And like joke, he began to exercise his spirit. He began to exercise his spirit. And the guy became so forensic that if he, want, if he holds your hand like this, he will tell you the names of everybody in your family first to clear your doubts. When he tells you like that, he will now move back and stand like this. So he will be watching your impression. You will call. When you doubt him, that's when his anointing is there. Ah! He will say, anybody who doubts God, please, I want to talk to the person. You know, here we think that uh, there's an atmosphere that the prophetic move. They have not seen a rugged prophet. When you doubt the guy, the thing begins to move. He will now say, Kai, Kai, Kai. He will say, who is Victor? You think it's coincidence. He will say, who was born in August 4th? He will now say, okay, wait. Who is the third born of your family? You now realize Victor is the third born. He was born on the 4th of August. You now say, okay, wait. Let me tell you something. I'm seeing three stars. How many children did your mother give birth to? You say, hey, we are three. Say, wait. Who is Victor? Who is Nancy? Who is Nathaniel? Then you will now begin to cry. There was a time, there was a time I bought suit to send to him. When I sent the suit to him, the guy I gave the suit, what happened to my senior in secondary school? So when the guy saw me, he was for me, senior man. I said, please, please. So when the guy got to Abuja, I was calling them, please, rush, rush. I'm, I'm busy, I'm busy. So they rushed and came and said, ah, sorry, sir. Hope I didn't waste your time. The guy said, uh, well, you, ah, yeah, you, you, I told you I was coming. I said, sorry, please. Sorry, we are men of God. Can I just pray with you? The guy said, no, no, no. He said, no, let me just, I appreciate what you have done. The guy now said, okay. He thought it was religious prayer. Father, bless my brother. So when he held his hand, he said, ah, sir, I'm seeing, I'm seeing Victor. Victor. The guy said, uh, that's my name now. They might tell you it was Victor that was coming with uh, what was born. He said, okay, um, Victor, I'm seeing 10th of October. The guy removed his hand, shifted back, and he wanted to weigh who, who, who he came from. Say, ah, he said, Victor, I'm seeing that you left, you graduated from Uni Agri in 2009, and you have applied for three jobs. And the reason why you are not getting that job is because I'm seeing somewhere in Okum, and in Okum, I'm seeing a man called Jemba. That's when Victor knelt down in the back. The next program, <laughs> hear me first. The next program he was supposed to go the next day, it was Victor that carried his Bible. <laughs> Victor that was wrecking that they wasted his time. The next program, it was Victor that paid for the car that carried them. So when God wanted to raise me, <laughs> I'm showing you some things that happen around your life that you don't know the implication. This guy in my eyes became a prophet. I will now go for a meeting. When I finish preaching, I will now give you the mic to manifest. My own meeting, you know, this guy will now manifest for five minutes. Everybody that came for the meeting will now line up and give him seat. Me that came, guest minister will now stand like this. <laughs> so sometimes I will look for him. <laughs> to God be the glory, great is he has done. I was dying to flesh. I was that. See, these things are spiritual syllables. Until a point came, it became normal. I will look for a hymn and be singing so that a while away time, I'll check again. The people gathered. Everybody will pop, pop, pop. I thought I was a guest minister. Suddenly, so people will volunteer to carry us home, and everybody is collecting his number. Even my guests that came, that invited me, will forget to thank me for preaching. I now understood why many revivers die. Because when God anoints one man, the others can't take it. 
you are together all of you love yourself as if it's one more that i gave birth to you until god begin to announce one then you hear all kinds of story that's when they will suddenly wake up and say this guy is arrogant this guy is this this guy all of them are lies the reason is because we don't understand the power of fellowship a generation that we emerge is a generation that understand how to die to flesh until the life of jesus becomes their dna that is the only time when competitions can no longer exist that's the only time when we can allow the move of god flourish in our midst so the apostles the bible said they gave themselves to fellowship can you tolerate it if you came for a meeting and suddenly they came and said no 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 sorry um we feel that it's sister Ruth that should lead the worship meanwhile you have made a new hairstyle and bought a new shoe and create you waited with the tailor till 11 pm to collect the gown now you are on your new gown and your new shoe you have made your new hair they now told you five minutes to the ministration time that sorry sorry uh, Ruth is is nancy that should minister today throughout that service even if god came down like a red coat you will not see him because we don't know the powers of fellowship and we think we can keep spiritual dimensions this is why our encounters are wasted this is why the grace of god upon our lives cannot be maximized because we are individuals look around our churches today there are many mighty men three people can come together and shut down this nation but they can never fraternize they don't know the remnant culture there are three men of god in this country that if they come together every if the government like they should do what they want they can cause things to happen in this country but there's no fraternity because we cannot give ourselves to fellowship we think the spiritual things are only about prayer so we don't pay attention to the nature of god that is is crying for expression in our spirit so a lot of spiritual investment are wasted we have not even become fathers but if you look around us we laugh everybody is talking about himself look i watched a clip a day ago and i saw the way benny him was healing pastor chris about moving in healing i was like uh -uh. Is he trying to psych him? But you could see the purity in the man of God. He was healing. Ben him that have moved in the healing anointing for 43 years. He's healing Pastor Chris as if Pastor Chris is a God of healing. But it's because his heart. God has dealt with him enough. He can walk fellowship. He knows the price. He can, he can bear the burden of fellowship. You can be in a clan for one year nobody has called your name meanwhile you are the reason why everything happening is happening the praise of men don't count anymore because you know the power of fellowship fellowship is not when people gather together fellowship is when our hearts are knitted together as one the holy ghost could not come down from heaven unless they were in one accord the power of fellowship these are the little little things that we can do and we think we can take our campus we are joking you don't know the princes that are coronated over these campuses. You don't know the powers that manipulate destinies on these campuses. You will be as you will be shocked that in every admission they know the number of virgins that are coming here, and they know the number of agents that will advance the kingdom of darkness in their four years of stay on campus, and they will go beyond their plan. Some are disflowered on the day of matriculation. You don't know the energy that is emitted on the campus. You think it's about a show where you hold your hands in parks and you speak in tongues. And then you leave there. The three of you that pray together, two are gossiping the other one. And we think we can move the hand of God. We don't know the power. They said the apostles, they gave themselves to fellowship. Secondly, they said they gave themselves to breaking of bread. We don't have time we don't have time we don't have time we are traveling to is to talk about prayer i wish i was able to talk about prayer we don't have time it's almost nine i want us to pray the mystery of bread breaking is what opens your eyes to see jesus as he is and until you see him as he is, you can't find yourself. So every time they came, they were tearing into pieces the word of God. So in their ranks, the least among them could present Jesus as the Messiah. And they could defend the resurrection. Hope you know, the doctrine and the, the gospel they preach in their day is different from our own. 
In our own now, we reshuffle Christians from one church to another and from one fellowship to another. We see there are a lot of things we don't know. That's why the devil can even play with our lives. The day you know truth, you become invincible. So when they broke bread, they were revealing Jesus in his full texture. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 3, the Bible said, Paul argued there every day for three weeks, proving to them that Jesus was the Christ and that he resurrected from the dead. So when they broke bread like that, even a drunk can come into their midst and then he will see Jesus and he will repent. They were able to reveal Jesus as he is. They were able to portray him in his full dimension. Paul will speak to the church of God in Galatia and he say, who has bewitched you? Before whom Christ was evidently manifested, crucified. So the way Paul preached Jesus to them, it was as if he was able to present Jesus on the cross like this. So what he showed them, it was the same experience with the man that stood and saw Jesus on the cross. That was the way Paul preached the gospel. He said by his gospel, they were able to see Jesus manifestly crucified. So you could not argue, you could not doubt. Their walls were sharper than encounters. Did you read about the men that walked with Jesus to Emmaus? Jesus was with them. They couldn't know him until he broke bread and their eyes opened. So their fellowship was a fellowship where they removed scales from the eyes of men. So you could come with your questions. You could come with your contradictions. You could come with your argument. Wait until one of them starts talking. When he's talking, you look as if you told him the story of your life and he is narrating it. He will tell you your crisis and he will tell you the cure. And then you will leave. You say, that man spoke to me. No, he was breaking bread. And when he breaks bread enough, he will bring you to the realm where he's operating. So when you hear truth, actually what truth does to you is that truth brings you into the place where the one who is talking from is talking. You will hear certain men until a point will come where anything they want to say, you know it. What is happening now is that you have gone beyond teaching. You have entered the realm where they are talking from. So you are part of them in that clan. A man can be preaching, you will tell the next thing he wants to say. That man has broken bread for you a long time. So a point will come when you can travel to where he travels to in the spirit. These things are beyond mantras. You become a partaker of their inheritance. You begin to walk in their clan in the spirit. And the day will come when you will journey in that place until you will find everybody that is in that ancestry. This is why many people enter into different revelations and encounters and they see men of old. When you start listening to them, you enter into their clan. I heard apostle until I began to hear, I began to have strange encounter with ancient beings. I didn't know that these men were in the same lineage. So when you go out, you go out with the strength of many. You are speaking as a witness of a clan. You can rise today and connect to some. See, it's not everybody that preaches the Bible that will speak to you. Because he can't talk to your DNA. He doesn't have the blueprint of your destiny. When you come to your company, you break bread. So a man can talk to your reality. This was a practice among the apostles. And they said they gave themselves to prayer. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Adonai. talking prayer let's pray prayer I'm just, that's what I'm just thinking I'm just thinking see we don't have time there are many other things I want to do this evening I would have shown you how prayer preserves the soul of a man and the move of God see don't be so encouraged that you know the word of God I want to show you something now most of the things Jesus did he didn't do because he was the son of God he did because he knows the things that work in this kingdom. Do you know that Jesus is the fullness of the word of God? Do you know that the Bible said God gave him the spirit without measure in John 3.34? In fact, when he came, they said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He said the same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines. 
in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. Jesus was the fullness of the word of God. So he didn't need to study. He is the word. When Jesus studies, it is to reveal to you that as a man you must have to study. Because he is the author and finisher of our faith. But himself is the embodiment of the word of God. But there were many things that Jesus only did by prayer. The Holy Ghost came and gave him a leakage. That temptation is coming your way. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. And I thought Jesus would stand and say I am the word of God. The Bible says he ran to the mountain. And then he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. Before the devil came. When the apostles, the disciples were about to fall into temptation. Jesus never counseled them. Because the cure to temptation is not counseling. He said pray that you fall not into temptation. That's what I apply. Even though I am the word of God. So when you see a man standing, it's because he's praying. And when you see a man falling, it's because he's no longer praying. He said, pray that you fall not into temptation. The devil came to attack Peter. And he said, Simon, Simon. Satan desires to have you, to sift you like wheat. But he didn't come to counsel Simon. And say, don't go here. If you go here, that's what they told us. When we were growing, they said, no, don't go here. Don't meet this person. This person, this man is a bad man. Don't go to this place, this thing. Everywhere they told us not to go to, that's the only place we went to. The moment you take your eyes, that's where we want to go to. We thought we could avoid things by counseling. But Jesus never counseled anybody against temptation. He told them to pray. The cure to temptation is prayer. He says, Satan desires to have you to sift you like wheat. He said, but I have prayed that your faith faileth not. When thou art recovered, strengthen thy brethren. Every season in Jesus' life were born by prayer. He didn't enter into the seasons of his life because he was the son of God. When Jesus was about to begin his ministry, he went to the mountain to pray. When the law and the testament were to be handed to Jesus in Matthew 17, he went to the mountain to pray. Even when Jesus was to go to the cross and to consummate salvation, he went to Gethsemane and prayed. That means seasons are born by prayer. Prayer is the precursor of spiritual seasons. The reason most people stay in one spot, they, they don't know why they are not progressing. They think the world is turning against them. The problem is not the world. The problem is they don't pray. So many seasons that should be born, you can't bet it. He said, as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth. Many possibilities about prayer. You will not know why men were able to traffic different inheritance that they received from God to the next generation by prayer. You, you are hoping you will raise your child and send him to Harvard and he will become like you. You are a joker. Most people raise their children, they watch them in Nigeria until they became 19 years and they send them to study law. And when they came back from Oxford, they came back with dreadlocks, with a very large guitar. And they became Rastafarians. They don't know how to preserve immortal dynasties. I can't talk prayer. Let's pray prayer. Let's pray. Stand up, let's pray now. Pray intelligently in the next 10 minutes. Listen, I began by telling you that the compass of your life are released into your spirit as bodies. As you follow those bodies, you enter into the mountain of encounters and the instructions of your destiny are given to you. So if you are here now and you don't yet know what God wants you to do, it's because you have failed to attend to bodies. And I said, just in case you have managed bodies well and you have received encounters and instructions for your destiny, it's still not enough. There is a culture for its preservation. One of it is the culture of fellowship. And when you see men who truly fellowship is because the nature of God has been born in their spirit. I said the next culture is the culture of breaking bread. Men who have seen their reality in heaven is because they can travel through the gate of revelation. The word of God has been made known to them. And I said the culture of prayer. Prayer is what opens up seasons over your life. And prayer is what keeps you standing. So at any point where you are, you may be at the point where you have not discerned the body of your life. That means as we pray, your prayer should be what? About the bodies of your destiny. Maybe you have
have bought it, but you have not tended bought it enough to come to a point of encounter. As we pray, your goal should be God, give me the encounter that will change my life. Maybe your own case may just be that you've had encounters, but you don't seem to know why you can't fellowship. Meanwhile, your security is in fellowship, but the nature of God is still lacking. You always think everything is about yourself. And the moment is not about yours, about you, you disconnect. You pray for God to bet in you the nature of the Christ. And maybe your own is the inability to pray. You pray that the Lord will rest upon you the grace for prayer. That's why I littered all of these things. So you can find yourself on this on this track. And wherever it is you are, that should become your focus. As we pray in the next 10 minutes. You want to speak in tongues? This is the time. you the first thing God will be doing tonight is to usher men into realms of encounters. Without encounters, without spiritual interaction, no matter how you act, you are a religious man. You can deceive yourself with Bible knowledge. You can deceive yourself with titles in church. Without encounters and spiritual interactions, you are a religious man. We are going to pray now. And as we pray now, the dew of heaven will begin to rest on people. Most of you, the hand of God will come upon you and throw you from your seat where you are sitting. The reason it will happen like this is so that you will know that you can create the same atmosphere in your bedroom. As we pray, the hand of God will begin to rest on people. Some of you will feel literal flames of fire. Literal flames of fire. The heavens will break upon you. Sobelete vana tabash. Paretes kopetes uza. Elelele samandre paras. Daya, daya, hete. Hete, sobehuna sakaite. Wabo, wabo. Let the atmosphere of heaven begin to encourage the beauty. Holy Spirit, begin to breathe upon us. Blow upon us like a rushing mighty wind.
Listen. There's a strange thing happening here now. The heaven servers of people are opening. Listen. There are men that have been struggling to break through in prayer. There's a new order. There's a new alignment pattern that is being created around your soul. There's a new oppression around your mind now. That is causing the climate over your head to shift. Men are about to enter into new ranking in the spirit. A new order of spiritual possibility. Just lift your hands to heaven. Ordination of intercessors. Precious Holy Spirit. From the left to the right. Lord, from the front to the back. A new intercessors you are coronating for territorial legislation. Right now, I stretch my hands, Lord. I say, let that ceremony begin. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Let the heavens stop over them. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Touch them. Ela sabá sabrá também até lá. E olha, e olha, e olha. Marinato se pendre para ia. Como vão no centro para Deus. E até panda sosos. E até panda sosos. E até panda sosos. Racapina tatalia. Mano sarande taila. some of you now to begin to have tangible spiritual experiences it's not an emotional thing right now holy spirit let that atmosphere of heaven begin to flow here lord from the left to the right from the front to the back blow upon them 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 The wave is coming stronger. 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 It is touching iniquity. It is touching religion. The wave is coming stronger. Lord, be quiet before the Lord. Be quiet before the Lord. Allow that wind to blow over your soul. You may not be excited about it, but something tangible is about to happen to you. It will change your life forever. Some of you, your eyes will open now. You will see in the spirit. Some of you will receive clear-cut instructions. You can never doubt it, even if there is a knife on your throat. Father, Begin to give them those encounters now. Begin to give them those encounters. 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 
Become real, Lord. Become real, Lord. Become real, Lord. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The hand of God is beginning to come on people. Stay connected. Stay sensitive. Stay sensitive. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. It's a spiritual ceremony. I'm not going to be breaking the atmosphere anymore. But as we begin to worship, most of you will be healed on your own on the strength of the energy of the atmosphere most of you will literally be carried to the place of your destiny from this service most of you will begin to walk in strange dimensions that you never imagined before now because there's a simulation going on right now even as i speak even as i speak even as i speak fresh baptism of fire a fresh baptism of fire a fresh baptism of fire a fresh baptism of fire you are not just intercessors you are territorial agents a fresh baptism of fire I call forth your ordination I call forth your ordination I call forth your ordination I call forth. I call it forth. The waters of the spirit flow. The waters of your spirit flow. Where the intercessors rise. Where the prophets. I call it forth. I call it forth. I judge the powers of iniquity. I judge the ordinations of darkness that have shut down the move of God in your soul. I call it forth. Hey! 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 Something is about to begin to happen here. There's a word of glory. It's about to descend here now. People's feet will literally be set on fire. People's hands will be set on fire. There's an enclopement that is coming. First comments. Men that their tongues will be coated with fire. Revivalists that we alter the stability of darkness over the souls of men.
just be silent everywhere. This is not the time to speak in tongues. Keep quiet and close your eyes. The Lord is bringing fresh ordinations on people. Just stay focused. This is not a time to be religious. You will lose a lot of things. Meetings must not go the way you think they should go. It's a time to look up to heaven. There's a dew coming from Zion. There's a fresh dew. There's a fresh dew. There are many things I'm seeing now. But just focus on Jesus. Allow the Holy Ghost to take charge. excited to be in God's presence this morning. You may be seated. God bless you. This morning, again, it's my privilege to be standing before you to bring to you the word of the Lord. I want to quickly acknowledge and honor our father in the house this morning, Reverend Nsa E E A O. I thought the excitement would be more than that. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. This morning, you know, we as young people, we are full of energy. Oftentimes, the challenge we have is with time. 
But I trust that the Lord will do a quick work this morning. Apostle will always tell us it doesn't take God eternity to do that which is eternal. So just lift your hands toward heaven and worship the Lord one more time. As we appear before the throne of him that is God eternal. Whisper something to the Lord from the depths of your heart. It's possible to be lost in the service. It's possible not to participate in the service. They are taking the announcements. The choir are doing the administrations and you are just there watching. Whereas every time we come to a corporate service like this, it's needful for us to make an appearance before the Lord. The Bible said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion that appeared before the Lord. Sometimes the reason we become weak, even though we are participating corporately in an assembly like this is because we fail to make appearance in Zion. Because every time we make an appearance, the Bible said of necessity, we go from strength to strength. So strength is a function of appearing before the God of Zion. Can you whisper to him this morning from the depths of your heart? Say something to the Lord. Maybe you've not told him this week how much you love him. Like the sister said earlier. Can you go ahead and just say something to Jesus? And I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. In your dwelling place forever. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. And so, precious Father, this morning, we thank you for the privilege that we have to congregate under the auspices of your spirit. We ask that you will instruct us. We ask that you will impart us we ask that you would empower us so that as we go into our world, we will become an extension of your reality in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. We are considering the subject living epistles. We are looking at the inability of being experientially living epistles as a challenge of enlargement. The Lord began to help us as we started this conference by exposing us to depths in scriptures as touching what it means to be a living epistle. And this morning, I would like to look at three very significant and very strategic implications of um, what it means or what living epistles are in the kingdom of God. Most times we approach truth from the standpoint of theological dexterity. Most times we approach truth from the standpoint of biblical accuracy but truth will not have implication in our lives except we begin to consider it from the standpoint of life it is possible to know about God and speak authoritatively and verbosely about him but it will not have existential implication in your life it's possible to talk about the healing power of God yet you are dying of sickness it's possible to talk about the love of God 
yet your heart is clotted with bitterness one of the effects that reveals the fact that we have not truly understood understood a spiritual reality is when it's only a mental assertion not an existential expression so we cannot truly understand what it means to be a living epistle until the implications of a living epistle becomes our daily expressions this is where truth becomes a, pro a proponent of life and reality many Christians in the world but oftentimes when we look at the territories it looks as if there are more unbelievers than there are Christians it looks as if there are more demons than there are angels and it looks as if the devil himself is more powerful than God there is a crisis that must be dealt with and one of the strategic intelligences that God has put in place in order to remediate the effect of the fall and to bring his kingdom to bear is the strategy of living witnesses walking on the streets and walking in the systems of this world the world have no reason to be in darkness if there are true witnesses and living episodes walking in every sphere of human endeavor so if our territory is in darkness it's not because the devil is strong it's because we have refused to take responsibility for who we truly are in god this is where realities become much more than theological assertions and biblical exegetical accuracy and intelligence three implications this morning and in the next 40 minutes will be done we began by saying a living epistle is a proof and an exhibit of the reality of God a living epistle is a communication a vessel of communication that brings to bear the mind of God the will of God the purpose of God so that the government of God is established in his sphere of influence and on the strength of this we declared very authoritatively that is beyond talking about God it is actually living as God and looking at the context where we find ourselves and the context in which we were born we saw that it would be literally impossible to live like God in a dark and a fallen creation first because we were born in sin secondly because the world itself is falling so what is that strategic intelligence that God has put in place to make a man who is born in sin into a fallen world to become an expression of God this becomes the weight of the subject not just to declare that we are living epistles not just to declare that we are supposed to be living epistles every one of us is aware of that how do we become living epistles becomes the big challenge that confronts every one of us when sin comes into your borders what do you do about it to manifest the righteousness of god becomes the big challenge the challenge is not to know that you are supposed to be the righteousness of god how do you become manifestly the righteousness of god becomes the challenge when the devil comes into the family how do you become the expression of the power of god becomes the challenge the question is not knowing what ought to be the question is how to get what ought to be to become what is and this is where many are challenged this is where the devil oftentimes tries to make a mockery of our belief system but there is a way and we saw that the simplest and most accessible way of achieving this reality is by our interaction with the word of god the bible said in the beginning was the word 
The word was with God and the word was God. He said, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So if there is darkness, it means the believer have not become light by the word. And if the believer have not become life, light, it simply means he has not made contact with life. Because until the life that flows from the world becomes the experience of the believer, he cannot be a light in darkness. And we said many times, interacting with the word of God becomes the challenge of the believer. We receive it graciously and sometimes even religiously, but we don't engage it. The Bible said in John chapter 1 verse 10 to 11 and 12, he said he came into the world. The world knew him not. Of course, the world cannot know him because the world is fallen. The world is alien to his reality. When Adam fell, creation and man rebelled. He said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the sons of God. And that is where most of us stop. We stop when we become the sons of God. So there is no experience. Legally, we are the sons of God, but experientially, we are expressions of different spirits apart from God. So you look at the sister, dressed half naked, and you say, what is your name? And she say, my name is Mary. You look at the brother, you say, what is your name? He was caught scamming on the internet, and he said, my name is Christian. Legally, he has been born again, accepted Jesus. But experientially, his life is an expression of Babylon. His life is an expression of Jezebel. His life is an expression of Mammon, the god of commerce. What is the problem? God is supposed to be the most powerful. The Bible said all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And you have received the all-powerful God. How come you are still a puppet in the hands of the devil? The inability to engage the world. In verse 16, he said, we beheld him. The people that journey from legal reality to experiential reality. He said, we beheld him. And when we beheld him, we no longer saw the logos. He said, we saw him as the glory of the father. Full of grace and truth. Others only received him and stopped. But some people went further. He said, we beheld. The moment we beheld we began to see something much more than the Logos. Somebody has received him because they told him, for God so loved the world and gave his only begotten son. But somebody else, after hearing that and accepting that truth, sat on the truth and began to look upon it. How is this possible? And as he beheld, the Bible said the glory was made manifest. And Paul came in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He said, we all with unveiled faces. What unveiled our face is the acceptance of Jesus Christ. He said, for the Lord that was given on the mountain, even though the face of Moses shone, till this day, the veil was upon them. But he said, as we turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. So when we received him, the veil is removed. But the irresponsibility of beholding, to see the glory, becomes the crisis of our life. He said, as we beheld him, we are changed from glory to glory, by the Spirit, even to the same image. So the Holy Spirit even though it's within, cannot walk until you behold. Because the spirit begins to walk when the believer begins to behold. And we said when the believer beholds, something happens. It becomes the physical, the manifest expression of everything the God on his inside is. This is when the believer becomes a living epistle. When he's able not just to host God, but to give expression to God. And if this truly begins to happen in your life, then in eternity, you become an entity of recognition. This is where I want to get into certain implications. Because most times, we listen to doctrines, we master them, but we don't know the implication. Most times, it's possible, especially for the youths, to assume that everything about life ends in time. Paul said, if only in this life we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Life is a ticket and an opportunity given to us to invest in eternity. I told us how that everything we see in life is a lie. 
Your looks, you are 17 years old. You say you are a slave queen. Wait until you become 40. That face that you rub all the powders, that shines and glows like the sun, when you become 40, then you discover wrinkles appear from nowhere and you begin to wonder. You thought everything was about what you had and then suddenly the wind comes and blows everything away and you say, what is going on? Even time itself, you now realize it's a lie. So men that have understanding, they look to the hills from whence their help cometh, because they have realized that life in itself can only be expressed in eternity. So eternity becomes their greatest motivation. This is why a man can give his body to be burnt. I was contemplating the justice system of heaven, and I wondered why a family with one child and God will send that boy to Afghanistan. And God knows, because he's omniscient, that this boy will be slaughtered in Afghanistan. And he sends that boy to Afghanistan, and the boy is slaughtered. And I began to wonder, what kind of justice is that? There are families that have ten sons, and don't know what to do with them. Why not pick one of them? And then I realize that the value of life itself is not in time. The man that God sends and runs his errand, what God is doing is actually favoring him because when true reality is made manifest, then he will realize that time would have been a lie apart from God. You reign, you ancient Zion king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion skin, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. What then is the first implication of a living episode or being a living episode? Is God witnessing. Witnessing is not telling people about Jesus Christ. If you have not been on this path for long, you will assume. Witnessing is just to talk to people about God. <laughs> if you choose this path, then you understand the frustration that men are going through. What do you think? You tell a harlot that God loves you. And then all of a sudden, she changes from being a harlot. <laughs> Witnessing is being able to bring God on the scene. It can be through your words. It can be through your lifestyle. But any believer that cannot bring God on the scene is not a witness. And if he's not a witness, he's not a living epistle. What is the implication? Without witnessing, there will be no proof that God is real. God is a lie, except there are witnesses. Witnesses are the proof that what we call God and everything we say about him is real. There is no way you can see him. He dwells in the invincible realm. And he's not in a hurry to prove himself. Many came and said, if you are God, show yourself. He didn't answer them. The only way he can be proven that God is true and is real is when you and I become witnesses. So the first implication of being a living episode is to prove to this world that there is God and that he is real and is alive. If men cannot see God through you, there is nowhere they will see him. So Paul, speaking in 1 Corinthians 3.1, he said, Do we therefore begin to present ourselves as commendation letters to you? There's no point doing that. You yourselves are the proof that God is real. Many believers in our offices, in our schools, in our banks, in the society, nobody can see God through us. So even when we say, God, Deo, the people say, yes, we know. You see somebody dying. You say, but God said this. You say, uh, I know. This is where religion was born from. Men could not present God. But they want to let the world know that God is real. So everybody is acting accordingly. But there is no life. And we are not only proving to the world. About God, his will and his power. Witnessing is beyond men. It is to all creation. In Job chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3, and chapter 1, from verse 6 to 9, Satan went to God. You don't know the politics that is going on up, 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 up in the spirit realm. 
So you don't know the implication of being a witness. Every one of us that is a witness is a spectacle on earth. Making statements beyond our understanding in the realm of the spirit. Satan went to Job. And the Bible said, there was a man in Oz from the side of the east. He said, it's a man that feared God and eschewed evil. Evil could not dwell within the borders of his habitation. His life was an expression of God. And Job came and said, Satan came to God and began to argue over Job. He said, I have moved through the whole earth. The earth is now my domain. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? That means the only legality that God had on earth at the, in the days of Job was the life of Job on earth. Satan came to make a boast to God that I have conquered the earth. The earth belongs to me now. I own it. And God said, have you seen my servant Job? So long as Job is still on earth, you don't own the earth. The power of witnessing. God is sovereign. The devil would have challenged him and successfully made a mockery of him. Except that there was something standing in between the devil and his challenge. Have you seen my servant Job? So the reason God was still sovereign in the days of Job was because Job was there. Without Job, the devil would have made a mockery of God. That's how important witnesses, witnessing is. Is it possible that God can come to Unica and the prince over this territory is bragging that I own this place. Anybody that comes there belongs to me. And then he goes to heaven to make a boast. And there's nobody God can point at and say, so long as this man is here, that territory still belongs to me. The reason God has a stake on earth is because they are witnesses. The reason God has a stake in a family is because they are witnesses. When you come to a family, the devil buffets at will is because there's no witness. This is why certain families, every three years, somebody dies. A devil is making a statement that I am God here. And when the devil is God, the Bible said, he cometh not but for kill, to steal, and to destroy. If you see a life that falls and rises, lived in iniquity, it means there is no witness. Sufficient witness is not there. Spirits are out to make a boast that they are dominating this realm. The physical creation, the visible creation is the realm of manifestation. Every spirit is making a boast and making, trying to have a stake in this realm. The only way a spirit can have a stake in this realm is when it has a representative and a functionary in this realm. The worship and memory of God will be lost from the earth, even though he's sovereign, unless there are witnesses. The stake God has on earth is you and I. The business of soul is too important because without it, spirits are insignificant. As mighty as God is, he will be insignificant on earth unless you and I represent him. That's the power of witnessing. But for you to be a witness of his spirit, you must have his life on your inside and express him. This is why talking about God is not the issue. And the spirits will prove you it's not something you just say and they say, okay, since you said so, let it be. <laughs> Job told God, God, Satan told God, he said, does Job fear you for nothing? That means you are, you are bribing Job to fear you. Job does not necessarily have your life. Job does not necessarily prove your existence. Job is just leeching on you. So he's not a witness. That's who most of us are. We come to God for bread, for breakthroughs, for job opportunities. So we are not necessarily representing God. We are only there to leech from his realm. And the devil came and said, take these things away. And you will discover that Job is not your representative. And God said, go ahead. What does a man do for God to make a boast of him? That's a man who is popular among the immortals. There are many of us that are popular among men. We have stature, we have rank among men. But in the spirit, there is no authority. Men that God can brag about, that have authority in the spiritual realm, are the men that God can, de can depend on, regardless of the issues on ground. Touch him! And the devil came and swept everything Job had. Job was immovable. And the devil was not enough. He came back. He said, skin for skin. If you touch his body, he will no longer be your witness. 
And God said, go and touch his flesh and touch his bone. Job chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. What a boast. No wonder Paul said, we have known God. He now corrected himself. He said, no, we are known of God. A man that can prove God and comes to a point where he can stake his life. That's a man that is relevant in heaven. Some people, their relevance will end on earth. But certain people, their relevance begins from heaven. Even when this world comes to an end, they will still be significant. The Bible said, men will come from the north, the south, the east, and the west to sit at the feet of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was not only a star on earth, even in heaven, he was a ranking personality because of the quality of life he lived on earth. Will you end your journey on earth as a miserable man because you have no stake in heaven? The key is to become a witness. Because the princes will come to challenge you. Circumstances will come to challenge you. Will you still be standing? Because when you stand, then you prove to this world that God is still alive. When you stand, then everything you say about God becomes true. Everything you talk about God will be a lie unless you are able to stand in the face of crisis. That is a witness. Job's testament about God will be a lie except as in the face of challenge, he stood his ground. So one of the ways of checking who truly is a witness is by trials. But you cannot pass through trials unless you have done business with the world. In Job 29 verse 4, he says, As I was in the days of my youth, when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacles. So it was by the secret of God. He said, by the secret of God, I walked through darkness. I put my feet in butter. When the candle of God was upon my head, and by light, I walked through darkness. He did business with the world until a point came when even the devil could not compromise him for what he stood for. So in all of eternity, the name of Job rang. The first book that was written in the Bible is the book of Job. Because the scriptures is a revelation of witness. God needed to reveal to us that our life itself has no value except as we can prove him. This is why men will die for the kingdom. And then you think they have lost, but in eternity say they receive the crown of life. Witnessing. The first implication of a living epistle. We can come and teach that we are living epistles and open all the scriptures and do the Bible study. The moment we step out of the church, the devil will come to check whether what we say we know it. You don't know it until you can prove it. You don't know it until you can experience it and communicate the same experience. It's easy to talk. Talk is cheap. Anybody can gather 10 scriptures. If you have a good concordance, you can gather 10 scriptures. Where you truly preach is in the face of crisis. Joseph, a young man, loving the Lord and making decrees that his life depended on God until he was sold. And the Bible said in Psalm 105 verse 17, he said he sent a man before them. How God wishes to make boast of men who can witness for him. You think they were selling the guy to be a slave, but the Bible said what? He sent a man before them. So everything happening to Joseph were orchestrations of God because God wanted Joseph to stand somewhere and prove that he is king. He sent a man before them, even Joseph. Whom they sold for a servant. His feet was bound with fetters. Until the time that the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord tried him. They sold him. You would think. He would say okay. Since God did not defend me. If God was there. Why did they sell me? The guy was in a strange land. But he feared the Lord. When Potiphar's wife came. He said how can I commit this evil. Against God. You will stand up and say you are betrayed. A witness. Sees it as an honor. When he dies for his king. For him, life in itself has no value except as he can serve the will of the king. The Bible said concerning David that after he served his generation, according to the will of God, he rested. So life is a summation of serving the will of the spirit of God eternal. A man who does not understand this will live for his appetite. And the Bible said him that liveth for pleasure is dead. Why he liveth? You may be breathing oxygen for 80 years, but you will not appear in the radar of heaven. When they look for you, you will not be found. Because the only signature you have in eternity is the quality of your witness. The first implication of a living episode is the ability to be a witness for God. That ability is what will keep the devil quiet in this world. When you see the devil shouting and bragging, 
in the life of a man or in a territory is because witness is insufficient. When witnesses rise, the devil becomes silent. God doesn't fight with the devil. It is witnesses that defend the integrity of God before the devil. Second implication of a witness. You may not understand the, the implication of these things for the young people, but if you want to be relevant in eternity, shift your priorities away a bit from those powders, from those wivons, from those suits and those cardigans. Shift your priorities away a bit. If not, when you show up in heaven, you'll be amazed. These things have eternal implication because we have judged that life in itself have no value in time except as there is a record in heaven. Second implication is that living epistles are the house of God. You know, Paul came by the spirit of revelation in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. And he said, we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. When you read it at face value, you may think it's just a theological statement. I got studying the scriptures. And I saw something that altered my priorities forever. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 21, from verse 1 to 3, and he began to speak about John. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. I didn't know the implication of that statement. Verse 3. He said, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Go to verse 11. I didn't understand the implication. Talking about the same city, he said, Having the glory of God and her light was like unto stones most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. Go down. He said, And had war great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Go down. Go down again to verse 14. He said, And the war of the city had twelve foundations. And in them, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the Holy Ghost began to speak to me. That was when I understood what Paul meant when he said we are God's building. Anyone that is not walked on in this world will not be a part of that city. I saw that the apostles of the Lamb, everything they did for God in time, became a signature in that city. So they became part of the foundation of that city. That means the new Jerusalem is not a block, it's people. So a man whose life is not committed to God on earth, in perpetual service, will not be part of that building. He said the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb were on the foundation. That means they were the signature and the foundation of the new Jerusalem. So when Paul said we are God's building, Paul was talking about a literal structure, but in the spirit. And I understood why Peter would say in first in first Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Now he said, We are lively stones. We are lively stones. So every time the word of the Lord comes to you and tries you, and God chisels things out of your life, what God is actually doing is shaping you so that you can fit into that beauty. So it's possible for a man to live on earth the way he wants and refuse God chiseling him. Refuse to walk in the will of the Father. What he doesn't know is that 
he is refusing to be part of the new Jerusalem because he will have no place to fit into that structure. When you see this structure, the reason the structure have many shapes is because the builders took time. Some of them were cut into half. And half was thrown away. It's only half that could enter the building. So for them, for that block to be part of the building, half must be cut off. For that block to be part of the building, certain things must happen. The block that is in the foundation most time is toughened. More cement goes into it because of where he, it will be in the building. So I now saw why the dealings of God are different for us. Somebody else receives God and in three years he's everywhere. Another person, God keeps him without being known for 12 years. I didn't know that God was actually building. So the quality of our soul becomes the blocks that forms the infrastructure of the new Jerusalem. So you can live in this world and die at the age of 90, but you have no place in Zion. We are lively stones. He said in Isaiah 28 verse 16, he said, I lay in Zion a tried stone, a cornerstone, a precious stone. He now said, they that believe will not make haste. So the second implication of being a lively stone is that you are the blocks with which God is building the city that will come in the life hereafter. A man who refuses the dealing of God upon his life, a man who refuses the workings of the word of God in his spirit, he may think he's being sparked on earth, but when Zion appears, he will have no place. So these subject matters, they are deeper than time. They are realities of eternity. You wouldn't know why. You have come to church. You have heard the word of the Lord and it's sweet. And when he enters your belly, it becomes bitter. Because you heard how that God loves you. But you now go into the systems of the world. Because you say you will stand for truth. Everybody begins to fight you. Suddenly they slash your salary. Suddenly they send you from the city center into the village. And then you are wondering, God, where are you? What God is doing is that he's building a house. He is bringing you into a structure that will stand for eternity. But the only way your, your toughness and your resilience can be verified is when the word of the Lord tries you. So for truth, many were killed. For truth, many were sent away from places of prosperity. And they lived in pain and poverty all their lives. On earth, they may be irrelevant, but in Zion, the Bible says they are part of the new Jerusalem. In fact, the Bible said the wall of that city glitters like jasper stone. So those people become like the very reflectors of God. They are not just part of a structure. That structure becomes a reflection of God. Those times when they went through that process, what they did not realize was that God was shaping them so that they can fit into different corners of the building. And by ordination, every one of us fit into different locations. The blocks may be many, but when the building begins, some enters the foundation, some enters the roof, some enters the corner. By ordination, we have different places to fit in. And the Holy Ghost will come to chisel us until we are able to enter into those different dimensions to form that building that will be a witness of the new earth that cometh from Zion. So when God deals with a man, it's not a time to cry. It's a time to give thanks. That is why he said, Abraham staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. They made a mockery of him. He had no child. The wife had no child. And then God comes and says, he did not only promise him. He said, now go and tell everybody that I am the father of many nations. What a mockery. You are there. Things are going wrong. And God is telling you to go and make certain declarations. And people are laughing. All the money you save for one year, God now say, donate it for this project. I wanted to buy a car. What you don't know is that God is building a city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. <laughs> we are lively stones. We are not just mere mortars. There is a place we need to stand in Zion. But whether we will stand there or not depends on what God does to us and the degree of our yieldedness to his spirit. This is where texture comes into Christianity. You can be preaching, the whole world knows you, you're on TV and you're on everywhere. And suddenly God shows up and says, go to the village. 
nobody captures you anymore. You were talking to 10,000 people. Now your congregation is 300. Sometimes your congregation becomes 10 or 15. And then you come to church, you are like, what kind of thing is this? Every first of every month, a seed will land in your account. Because there was a senator in your church. Now God tells you, go to the village. I want you to provide witness. But a man who does not understand that God is building the house, he will remain in the city. Because he thinks relevance is in time. But when we begin to discern Zion correctly, something happens. We turn and face the Lord. This is why the Bible will say, Moses, when he was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than the pleasures of Egypt, which is for a season. You may not know how hard these things are. When God chooses a man, he doesn't kill him, he's alive. He said, we are living sacrifice. You are there. God tells you to go and apologize. That's the hardest thing to do. You are older. You are more influential, but he say apologize. What he's trying to do is to remove that excess, that, that oblong dimension of that block because there is somewhere that block cannot fit into. Living epistles. Stories that God is telling from heaven. And the only way it could be captured is that we are lively stones. When God makes a stone out of a man, even the devil can't challenge him anymore because he has been chiseled. There is nowhere to hold. Jesus said, this, the prince of this world cometh to me and findeth nothing. Why? The Bible said, in the beginning was the world. He first of all gave us a robust citation about Jesus. The world was with God. The world was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything that was made that was made. Three very heightened recognition. One, he was the, in the beginning with God. Two, the creator of all things. Three, he is God. And then this same Jesus that you call creator, that you call God, that you call being in the beginning, you now tell him to go to Jordan publicly and kneel down before John the Baptist. Chisney. This is why he's the author and finisher of our faith. Chisney. The reason why many marriages don't work is because people don't know that they are lively stones. The man comes to say, I'm the head of this house. Meanwhile, God say, apologize, but I am the head of this house. <laughs> The woman, ah, no, he's wrong, he's wrong. God said, knee down like Sarah and call him Lord. They say, no, it can't happen. So the family scatters. Nothing God builds will ever work unless men become lively stones. This is why our families will fail. Because we don't know the intelligence of becoming lively stones. He tells the man to love his wife as God loved the church. How is it possible? That means your affection for your wife is not emotional. It's the love of his spirit. The only way you can know how it works is when you see how it is done in the spirit realm. Even your parents' advice will not work. You must do it the way God depicted it through Jesus Christ. The love of his spirit. That's when sometimes you come home and God say, knee down. And you say, I am the head of the family. The family will break. Because what you call a family is an institution that God created from the spirit. And only by spiritual dictates can he find expression. But only lively stones understand the intelligence of building. We cannot build until we allow God to chisel us. Until we allow ourselves to become stones that the builder can do anything he wants to do upon. This is why in life we are not called to be creative. We are called to be yielded. The creative one is the Messiah. Sometimes he allows you, you are talking as a child. Then you came to an age and he said, no more talking. He is the one who is allowed to be creative. Because you don't know the part of the building you fit in. Have you seen a block that said before I want to be at the foundation? It is not given to you. It says it's not given to man that walketh to order his steps. You want to be eternally relevant? You must become a stone. Lively stones. The reason why we can't move forward even though we know so much is because we are not stones. Men that cannot be tried, they want to handle glory. Say when God shall build up Zion, that is only when he can appear in his glory. Every man God ever walked with, there was a chiseling process. Many cried. And then they thought God will show mercy. That is when the mercy of God is lost. Because he wants you to be eternally relevant. He will cut off that oblong head until you become part of his specification. He will wipe up that your shoulder that you carry like this. Because you need to fit into somewhere. And the space is not very large. The space is narrow. You are too big. You cannot enter. So he will cut off your feet. That your eye that beholds evil, he will cut it off. <laughs> Lively stone. 
The reason the principalities are strong in the territory is because we are not lively stones. We come to talk about a God that does not have authority over us. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Because you have a good voice. You prepare on Sunday with high heat and very elegant gown. Then you are singing. You think God is impressed with your voice. If it's based on voice, he would have allowed only angels to worship him. That person that refused the chiseling of God, he thinks he's coming to worship God. Worship is not singing. It begins with a life of obedience. <laughs> this is why we sing, nothing happens. This is why we shout, nothing happens. Even when we pray, nothing happens. Because we are not lively stones. Our voices doesn't resonate in Zion. We are only known on earth. So our prayer now is a function of volume. Father! Nothing happens. When a lively stone thinks about God, things happen. When a lively stone whispers, heaven can move on his account. I am the Lord that confirmed the wars of my servants and performed the counsel of my messenger. Except they don't talk. The moment they alter their voice, their voice becomes like the sound of many waters. Even the principalities will bow. Living epistles is not a doctrine. It's more of a consecrated life. What can God do with you? What can God do with you? It is the extent to which God can work on you that will determine your relevance, not what you know about God. We are out of time. <laughs> I would have talk, spoken to you about spiritual authority as being superior to the anointing. The reason why people fall in church but their life is not changed in the territory is because we have anointing, we don't have authority. Meanwhile, the business of colonization is a business of authority, not anointing. The devil was in heaven, most anointed of the angels, but he knew that for him to have government and authority, he needed to ascend the throne. Even though he was most anointed, the Bible said he was the revelation of beauty and glory. He said from the day of your creation, he said you were covered with the finest stones, jasper, topaz, gold, sapphire, carbuncle. He was clothed, he was shining like the sun. He said you walk in the midst of the coals of fire, you were in Eden from the day of thy creation. Thy taps and thy tablets were in thee. The guy knew the emotions of God so much that if God wanted to laugh, he knew what to do. If he shakes his body, heaven is saturated with sound. Different kinds of sound that communicated the emotions of God. The Bible said you are the anointed cherub that covered it. So he was both a cherubim, he was also a seraphim. Cherubims are the ones that, caught, that guard the jealousy of God's glory. Seraphims, they are the ones that keep the holiness of God moving in the coals of fire. The devil was both moving in the coal of fire and he was both a covering for the glory of God. But he knew that anointing cannot colonize a territory. Meanwhile, in our generation, we celebrate anointing. But there are no men of stature. The same people that come to church, they are the same people in the nightclubs. The same people we preach to on the crusade ground, they are the same people that are killing and doing all kinds of evil. Because we cannot talk to their heart. We only talk to their head. Because even ourselves, there is no government. Jesus said, for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they too might be sanctified. The prince of this world, come to me and find that nothing. That's a lively stone. That's a living epistle. When he talks to you, you have no choice. He saw a tax collector. In the days of old, the tax collector is like one that walks in Chevron. He said, follow me. And the guy abandoned his job. He saw fishermen with their parents. He said, follow me. They abandoned their net. That's not a man talking. It's a lively stone. That's a living epistle. Every time he speaks, you hear the voice of God through him. But it begins with government. Suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So the creator went down to be baptized by creation. Many of us cannot bow. We are too strong in ourselves. How can you walk for God when you are strong? That's why we have no authority. The devil will come to your family and steal your family members. You cry, you say, God, why? Meanwhile, you are the priest of that family, but there is no authority. Because when God wanted to deliver that family, that was when he came to you and said, stop fornicating. You didn't know that stop fornicating is not just holy living. It will confer authority on you and preserve your family. When God came and said, stop lying, you don't know that that is the life of your elder brother. I was living carelessly. 
God will come to me and say, pray at night. I thought it was a, a, it was a religious act. Pray at night. I kept quiet for six years. And in six years, my mother and my brother were killed. Until I realized that something was wrong. And when I began to obey, the same witch came from my father. And then God told me, I'm now a gatekeeper. I did not only stop the situation, I killed the witch. And he confessed before dying. He said he killed my brother. So those days when God was telling me, wake up and pray at night, it was my brother's life he was bargaining. But I was not wise. He was bargaining my brother's life with me. He was bargaining my brother's destiny. He was bargaining my brother's future. I thought it was about sleeping and praying. I didn't know that life depended on it. My father too would have gone. Because I think it's about luxury and sleep. So now, from 10 to 12, everything you do, you keep your energy because you need to wake up at night. Because life depends on it. This is where authority is born. There are many people that the destiny of a territory is in their hands. But they think that um, they need to have that girlfriend. They think it's about girlfriend. They don't know that that consecration God is bringing upon their life is to save a generation. It is when you commit to it that something now happens to your voice. God puts authority there. So when you scream, the princes in darkness will run away. He said, the land of Zebulun, Matthew chapter 4 verse 16, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Light was not because it was a lie. It was because he went to John and said, suffer it to be so for now. It's because the Holy Ghost led him into the wilderness to be tempted and he followed. So when he came out from dealing, he became a light. Most of you, your brothers, your sisters, your fathers will die. Unless you rise up. The significance of lively stones. The significance of being a living epistle. Is beyond talking about God. Is bringing God on the scene. But this is where many cannot walk. So our Christian life is reduced to religion. Let's bow our heads and pray. That God may help us by his mercies. To become a witness. So that our life will prove the existence of God. That will become lively stones. And become part of the eternal buildings that is raising in Zion. And that we will become men of authority. That we advance his purpose on the face of the earth. The purpose of God on earth will die. Unless men of authority rise. Our life on earth will be a waste. Unless we become lively stones. That will be part of the building in heaven. And God will never be accepted on earth unless we truly become witnesses the significance of a living epistle you ask the Lord to help your heart now maybe you have been in church for 5 years, for 1 year, for 10 years for 20 years and you did not understand that being a witness is beyond talking about God being a witness is proving in your office that God is real and not just that God is real, that he has a purpose he has a will, he has a government maybe you did not know that being a witness is also the only ticket you have to be relevant in Zion. And maybe you did not know also that the purpose of God on earth will never be accomplished unless you become a witness. I see many people that stand on Facebook and on media insulting pastors. They are funny people. They don't know it's not the job of a pastor to bring the will of God to the earth. It's the job of every believer. We are the ones to do the work of the ministry. It has nothing to do with the pastor. But there are no lively stones. Adosh Elohim Adonai Elohim We worship you most high Kadosh, Kadosh Do Kadosh Elohim Adonai Elohim we Next time God puts in your heart to bring that money to church know that it's not you doing the church a favor. Know that it's you securing a place for yourself in Zion. Next time God tells you to speak to that sinner know that it's not you just bringing salvation to that sinner. It is you bringing God into this world. And next time God gives you an assignment, an instruction, know that it's you walking into the womb of spiritual authority.
I hope you enjoyed this video and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video, and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.